Well, good evening, everybody. It is so great to be with you and to see such a great turnout for tonight, uh, so much so that my colleague Nate had trouble parking, which, you know, is, is, is uh, the course here. But uh, my name is Julia Glanz. I'm the city administrator for the city of Salisbury. And on behalf of Mayor Day, who uh, unfortunately could not be with us tonight, and the city of Salisbury, I'm proud to stand here with you all to celebrate the Bosserman Center's 30th anniversary. While I did not know Phil or Carol Bosserman personally, as some of you did, I would imagine that they could not have foreseen the impact that their work and this center have had on the lives of so many, from SU students to seasoned professionals across the world. As a proud Salisbury University graduate of the Conflict Analysis and Dispute Resolution Master's Program, I understand the significance of SU's challenge to students as we inspire them to make tomorrow yours. For many students and alumni, the Bosterman Center for Conflict Analysis and Dispute Resolution has played a part in their personal and professional development, taking young scholars and equipping them with the knowledge and experience while enabling them to become socially responsible and civic-minded global citizens. Working to resolve disputes both near and far, the impact of the Bosterman Center is felt far beyond the bounds of our city. Yet I am so glad that the center is proud to call Salisbury home. Congratulations on 30 years of tremendous work, and I know we all can't wait to see the next 30. So on behalf of the mayor's office, um, Brian, if you want to accept this, we have a citation. So um, it states, whereas the Bosserman Center for Conflict Resolution was established to launch a peace studies minor at Salisbury State University, and subsequently both undergraduate and graduate programs in conflict analysis and dispute resolution at Salisbury University. And whereas the center expanded into a nonprofit organization, making it possible to offer mediation and conflict management services to the citizens of Salisbury, and in doing so, supporting the operational success of the various city departments by facilitating dozens of workshops and training its employees. And the Bosterman Center for Conflict Resolution has provided associated dispute resolution services to the mayor's office, including supporting many of its sanctioned projects and commissions in the community. And whereas the Bosterman Center for Conflict Resolution has supported the city of Salisbury and Wicomico County's judicial system by mediating several thousand court cases and supporting the works of, Mar of Maryland Mediation and Conflict Resolution Office Macro, and whereas the center has trained several thousand students and community members to serve local, state, and global mediation needs that foster a more resilient and interdependent global community, and whereas the Bosserman Center has facilitated local dialogues on justice, environmental issues, and the importance of city-county cooperation to support a thriving and dynamic Eastern Shore. And whereas the Bosserman Center for Conflict Resolution has dedicated its efforts to inspiring, educating, and mentoring students in various conflict management tools and styles to build resilient future professionals who will serve our communities, bring positive changes to systems and workplaces in need of augmentation, and will work to support our citizens and businesses in constructive problem solving and meeting the demands of an ever-changing world. Now, therefore, uh, on behalf of Mayor Day and the city of, Salisbury, I, city of Salisbury, I do hereby congratulate the Bosserman Center for Conflict Resolution on celebrating 30 years. So. Congratulations. Karen, you want to know what we do? This is <laughs> There's a nice summary. All right, Senator Carroza, let's, let's get you up here. Good evening, Salisbury University. Let's hear it for 30 years of the Bosterman Center for Conflict Resolution. I am so glad that you are having this event this evening for had you had it uh, two weeks ago during the week, I would not be able to join you because we just finished a 90-day legislative session in Annapolis. So uh, when Chinsia started working um, with our office, I was delighted that I could be here in person. And I wanted just to, before I formally present um, uh, some citations and recognition of a very grand anniversary, I wanted to share with you that I'm very proud that this past legislative session in Annapolis, I had a student from the, uh, the center here who graduated and now works for me in my Annapolis office, Diana Grechahina. Some of you may know her, uh, Russian-American, um, who works in my Annapolis office. 
and worked full time during session and is now working for me part time now that session is over. And I also had a Salisbury University intern, Katie Smith. So I know the president likes hearing this, that we had a strong Salisbury University presence in Annapolis. So let's hear it for Salisbury University. <laughs> One of the reasons I was so excited to join you tonight um, was what you are all about. I mean, I think about your name, the Bosterman Center for Conflict Resolution, and I'm coming off this 90-day legislative session in Annapolis where your talents and your skills are needed up there in Annapolis. So I want to let you know there's plenty of opportunity for you. But um, it also had me reflecting that um, what we are facing in today's society, all of our challenges, um, whether it's coming off of the pandemic, the future challenges we have um, with our children, that whether it's in Annapolis or how um, divisive everything is at the national level, and now, of course, with the, the war in Ukraine, that the talents that you have and the skills that you have honed at this center with people like Dr. Gandhi, 88 years old, let's hear it for that, right? Happy birthday. <laughs> but I just hope that you appreciate this opportunity because as I'm trying to communicate to you here tonight, we need those skills, we need those talents. Of course, uh, I will be totally parochial and let you know we'd like you to stay here on the shore to uh, continue your good work, but uh, whether that's here on the shore in the state of Maryland or at the national and international level, we do need you. And I have so much respect for this program and uh, with Dr. Pockenhorn being um, so um, generous um, in educating me a little bit about what you all are about. And I was happy to talk to Chintia, who I, you know, reminded me she received my Maryland uh, Senate scholarship, which I'll remind the students here, if you live in my district, you are eligible for my Senate scholarship. So we'll make sure you have that information. As I thought about your impact, and again, whether it was at the state level, national level, international level, it also occurred to me really life always comes back to those personal encounters. That it really just starts with your interaction with the, the next person, whether it's a family member, a friend, a colleague, a supervisor, um, the stranger. And that you have now this, these talents and skills that have been honed that is just going to make a tremendous impact on your community your family, your community, your workplace, wherever you go. And I wanted to recognize that. So much so that we have two recognitions for you. So um, I'm not sure who will be accepting the Senate um, resolution. You all can see it's an official seal here. And it says, did you want a student or a board member? Would one of the board members like to come up? And how about a student? Have to make it official. Okay, so on the Senate, it says, resolution, be it hereby known to all that the Senate of Maryland offers its sincerest congratulations to the Bosterman Center for Conflict Resolution, Salisbury University, in recognition of the 30th anniversary of the Bosterman Center of Conflict Resolution and its dedicated efforts to inspiring and mentoring students in problem-solving leadership. And the entire membership, which is made up of all 47 state senators in Maryland, extend our best wishes on this memorable occasion and directs this resolution to be presented to you on this 20th day of April 2022. It is signed by our Senate President, Bill Ferguson, and also your Senator, Mary Beth Carosa. Congratulations. And as I like to say, and there's more, don't go anywhere. Oh, there, there's more. <clears throat> I have been asked to present Governor Hogan's citation recognizing your 30 years to you in person. And I have to tell you, I'm always very humbled when I have the opportunity to present Governor Larry Hogan's citation to you because that means what you are doing here 
course is being recognized by the entire state. And so, again, you have the official seal with the state of Maryland on top, and it says, Governor of the State of Maryland to the Bosterman Center for Conflict Resolution 30th Anniversary, be it known because of your demonstration of high integrity and ability, meriting our great trust and respect, we are most pleased to award you this governor's citation in appreciation of your outstanding services to the citizens of this state. And it is signed by our governor, Larry Hogan. Congratulations. Well, I don't have a, an official proclamation, um, but I have just the briefest of welcomes uh, to Salisbury University. It is fabulous to see such a wonderful crowd here today. We are really getting back into the habit of being social animals, and I'm, I'm just loving to see it. Brian, congratulations to you and your amazing team for uh, your 30th anniversary uh, of this great center. Um, Dr. Gandhi, happy birthday, and, <laughs> and uh, Senator Carosa and City Administrator Glanz, thank you for being here. Thank you for recognizing the excellence of this institution. Have a lovely evening, everybody. And now we have Dr. David Buchanan, who's on the board of directors for the center, and a previous, he's a retired SU provost. Thank you, Brian. You people are really lucky you get back-to-back -back chemists. And in following our tradition, it's the organic chemist that follows the physical chemist. I, I am a former provost, and I want to bring you greetings as a board member. Uh, some of our board members are here tonight, and Brian is going to tell lies about us a little later, so I won't introduce everybody right now. But. Uh, <clears throat> what I would like to do is tell you a bit about our role as a board of directors. And it's really the oversight of the center's operation and also approval of major budget expenditures. Incidentally, we don't do that enough. Uh, we're guided by the center's mission. And I'm going to now quote it. It's providing a systems-based approach to the effective analysis and practical resolution of social conflict. This center has an international reputation. We are offered many opportunities to be involved in various programs, sometimes grants, contracts, research programs, educational programs. No way can the center do everything. And part of the board's role is to provide some guidance to Brian and his staff over which activities seem most appropriate. And the deciding factor is how will students be involved. Student learning is really the center of the center and has been since the very beginning. Before I even arrived here in 2001 as provost, I had heard of the center and its reputation. And when I got here, I was really pleased to find that Brian reported to me on behalf of the center. The student involvement at the center resonated with me because I see a parallel with what goes on in the sciences in undergraduate research experiences, and then adding on to that graduate experiences. And I think that the center provides the real hands-on type of experience that really starts the students to understand what it is to be a professional in their field to develop confidence in their own abilities to analyze and contribute to the solution of problems. The center provides these opportunities across the entire campus, not only to those who are majoring in conflict analysis. 
A little bit later, I think Brian is going to talk to you about his idea of a teaching hospital model for what we do. If you have ever had the experience of being in a teaching hospital, either as a patient or a visitor, you would have noticed that there are faculty members, there are clinicians, and there are students, and they're all working together to solve whatever problem it is. And that's how we like to see the Bosserman Center operating. That's what the board is all about. So, thank you very much. And Brian, you're up next. I want to spend a little bit of time before we start handing out the birthday presents. And do you guys go to birthday parties? You have unbirthday presents. Do you know what I'm talking about? So it's a birthday present for for the birthday boy. But everyone there winds up going home with something. Yeah. Um, so we we have a slight uh, scenario where we got a present for everyone in the room. And and uh, my friend emailed me and she said, "Okay, Brian, uh, the presents will be there for the 20th anniversary." of the center on the 30th of April. And I said, Sandy, no, 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 Sandy, it's the 30th anniversary on the 20th of April. So, so here's my thing. Uh, the center's on the corner of college in Camden, and when, the, when they come in, I'll send out an email, and you're more than welcome to come by and get your present, okay? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, and you know what, honestly, it's, it's a gift that keeps on giving. It's a book from one of the benefactors of Salisbury University in our department and the center's name is Jack DeBoer. He died last March at the age of 91 or 90. Um, perfect gentleman and his story epitomizes what to do when things go wrong, to have a moral compass and to, to do the right thing. So uh, what I want to do is spend a little time thanking people and, and first starting with Dr. Gandhi because um, 20 some odd years ago his experiments with truth hit home with me. I thought, what better place to give it a shot than at the Center for Conflict Resolution at Salisbury University. And as our spiritual guide and guru, uh, Arun has, along with the board and administrators on this campus, guided the center uh, expertly along the way. So uh, I'd first like to start off by saying thank you to a lot of people. And the first group would be Lynette, Cynthia, Debbie, Tony, Linda, and Ty. That's one group. And then Kevin, David, Dale, Marvin, and the gang of guys that have worked in a physical plant to keep the house warm in the winter and cool in the summer, and to all the housekeeping folks who have taken care of us and made sure that we're healthy and safe. And uh, we see them every day, we appreciate them, and this is as much for them as it is for everybody else. And then I'd like to also add a thank you to uh, Chief Lashley and the SU Police Department. We've had some unusual characters on our campus, setting heads of state which will require security, which means Chief Lashley has to spend time coordinating with the courtesy services of the United States Secret Service, Homeland Security, private details, international security teams, Maryland State Police, and all sorts of people. And we've had only two breaches the entire time. <laughs> And one was some little kids got through like five layers of security and it was all set up and there was, we'd be very cautious. Homeland Security kind of took control. And the chief was a perfect gentleman, did everything. And these little kids broke through between the ages three and five with teddy bears and, and coloring books and crayons and lunch boxes and went right up to the president, blew right through everybody. And I'm thinking, oh, there's gonna be an African action report on this one. And, and he says, may I pick her up? I'm a grandfather. Of course you say, of course, yes, yes. Uh, but uh, the good news is that the little kids broke the ice. And I don't know if Evandro is here or, but Evandro is a graduate of our program. He's an officer in the SU Police Department. And uh, we got a special request. And I just wanted to point him out just because he's going above and beyond. And a friend of mine, one of the guys that came to this, the university is the president and prime minister of uh, East Timor, Jose Ramos Horta, and we had invited him years ago, and about four months before he was due to arrive, an assassin came after him and murdered his, his bodyguard, and, and uh, Jose took four shots and was in a coma, was flown to Australia, and, and almost died. Uh, but when he showed up here, he had a completely different attitude. When you're almost killed, 
nothing bothers you. And and he wasn't he was presidential in front of you guys, but he was he was in a mood to horse around. And I thought, oh my gosh, Ivandro, you got to protect me from this guy. We're going to get arrested. <laughs> but he really enjoyed his stay here. He helped a lot of students. Uh, some some of our students actually wound up in East Timor working for the government. But I also want to add a special thank you to three members of IT, uh, Kevin Malone, Lisa Chase, and Jim Berg. And although they don't read or speak Polish, we had an incident where a guest on campus was extremely upset because his laptop was not working. And he was like that kid who needed a snack. And we called and said, can you come over to this hotel and find out what's going on? And I stuck my neck out. I said, we have the best IT people. They'll figure it out. Well, and, and, and Kevin and Jim and Lisa came over and started playing with these computers. And, and uh, because they knew the pull downs and what it all meant, the president's going, oh my gosh, they speak Polish, they read Polish. But they fixed it. And, and he was extremely happy. And it may not mean much to you, but when, when you're sweating every detail and you've got a guest, uh, a head of state who's not in a good mood, and three people come in and just do their jobs and change it from night to day, you always remember that. You always appreciate it. And I wanted to thank them for that. I also want to move on and talk about some of the early people and just to remember them. The ones who are no longer with us are obviously Phil and Carol Bosterman. They had a dream with their friends from PALS, the Peace Alliance of the Lower Shore, including Rick Maloof, Polly Stewart, who used to teach in the English department, Jackie Fritz, Jim McDonald, and uh, Liz Bellavance, from the, the better half of President Bellavance. And um, they all had a lasting impact. Their fingerprints are still felt on the operation of the center. And I'd also like to add, there's been quite a few folks in that lineup, but Joan, Ed, Maria, uh, Luis, and Penny are some of the people who helped us get into the schools because the original mission was Teaching Peace, the Center for Teaching Peace, with a small grant uh, from Coleman McCarthy. And they were the ones who went in as professors and as Peace Alliance and Lower Shores and just people who wanted to see the schools and volunteered their time to pull it off. So you, you could tell they were really bought into and took ownership of this. And then, then we hit a snag because it got pretty popular and we didn't have enough people. We had more than enough students and we didn't have enough schools. And so we kind of expanded the mission. We expanded what we were uh, going to offer students. And we have a, a group of folks that are connected to the center who you don't see on our webpage. And they're an inter international group of folks who believe in what we do, and they've been extremely helpful. One of them, obviously, is Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who's a friend of Dr. Gandhi's and mine, and he died on Christmas Day, and we were working on a Christmas vi uh, birthday video for you. Uh, but the consolation prizes, we got Bono. <laughs> Bono uh, did a little video for Arun. But, but uh, Desmond Tutu uh, is cut from very special cloth. He, he welcomed Arun and SU students to Cape Town. He made videos, funny videos. He wrote lots of letters. He would jump in on classes. And this is an extremely busy person. And he always found time for us. And so even though you're a big shot, uh, he, he had his, his humble nature and said, with pleasure. It's like a South African thing, with pleasure. Would you help, right, right? <laughs> Can you help? Yeah, with pleasure. We also had in that same laudatory group is uh, the prime minister and former president of Israel, Shimon Peres, Ambassador John McDonald, the father of Jim McDonald, who was our chairman of the board, um, who was behind the United Nations resolution for the International Day of Peace. He was the author, and it was sponsored by the Costa Rica delegation. Uh, John Hume, Sir John Pokinghorn, and Jack DeBoer. And we'd also like to thank, who are still with us, Sir Ronald Cohen, Under Secretary Tom, UN Under Secretary General. Gian Domenico Pico, Johnny, friend of Tom Boutros, UN Undersecretary General Ibrahim Gambari, uh, Undersecretary General for Political Affairs, uh, probably the most important Undersecretary General position, uh, Dr. Rakuzo Morapa, Mr. Terry Waite, who's an international hostage negotiator, Professor Morva Johnson, Dr. Sarah Cobb, and, and Dr. Mark Brennan. I want to stop just for a second. He's a UNESCO chair. He's a distinguished professor, and he's a, the, in the first cohort, the 1992 cohort, 
here at Salisbury State College, I think it was back then. And, and he got turned on in his last year by this guy named Phil Bosserman. And if you look at what the UNESCO chair, Dr. Brennan, is doing around the world, working with uh, some very interesting people, doing some excellent work, it started right here. And he's very proud to say that he walked in the middle of the pack and he was an average student. And, and beer and girls were more important and all that kind of stuff. And, and, but Phil, Phil did something, got a little fire, and then Mark has been extremely helpful to us. Mark helped us establish the Bostrom and UNESCO fellowships to send people like Nate Sampson and Abe and several other people to Paris to study prevention of violent extremism. Uh, let's see here. Just these people give their resources, but the resources are time and their talent. And that really says something. Somebody can write a check, and it's very important. We need this for student scholarships, but when people give their time and talent to something, you can tell they, they understand what we're doing and they believe in what we're doing. And they also gave us the Rolodex, which is important. And I always tell the students, you're always on audition every day. Go in there, and just because they came from Harvard or American or Georgetown, go in and show them what you have. And when they do, it's amazing. <laughs> We have had deans and big shots in the federal government will literally call up and say, what are you guys doing over there? And have them pay a visit. And it's because we have a nice sweet spot. We have the ability to work with these folks one-on-one -on, -one on skills acquisitions, analytical skills, those sorts of things, to, to beat the competition, so to speak. They have a leg up. I also like to say switching to the staff. There's one of them right there, Robert Lachance. You don't need to go anywhere. Uh, Patty Basiri, Michelle Ennis, Ben, Abigail Horton, Rob, and Haley Lachance. Ben Ross, I am so surprised to see you. Ben Ali Ross Sharif uh, in the back. I haven't seen him in years. Uh, Katie McDowell, uh, Christian John, Mark Hobson, and a whole bunch of other people. And these students came into the center and wound up being staff. And we had to figure out how to be creative with some resources to get a lot done. And they always figured out a way with me how to do it. We have a multitude of graduate students, and I'd like to thank Dr. Clifton Griffin for his support, not only of all the graduate students, but the ones who've been able to work in the center and helping us all along the way with Haley the Chance, some of the grants and contracts. Some of those got a little complicated, but uh, we got through it, and the students got a great experience as a result of it, so thank you. I'd also like to thank John Wesley Wright. I'm almost done, guys. John Wesley Wright, the tenor, our tenor. He is saying for so many presidents and prime ministers, and he just gets up there and brings the house down. If you haven't heard John Wesley Wright saying, you must before you graduate. He's been accompanied by Bill Folger. I'd like to thank all the guys in the department and uh, people, Dr. Fouts. Um, Dean Revisa, who has gone overboard with helping our students to do international work. Yeah, he's a gem, we should keep him. And quite a few other faculty. I just wanna say, something about the center size and then get right to the, <clears throat> actually the university size and then get right to the presence and, <clears throat> and the thank yous. Salisbury University, if it was a research one institution, probably couldn't pull this stuff off. And I've been in research one, I've worked in these research one institutions and the, the ratio to students and uh, the, the pressure to publish and all the other things that faculty and staff need to do makes it difficult to have a truly clinical position and be a faculty member, but at Salisbury, our focus is on you guys. And, and anything that has student involvement is appreciated and supported by the administration, so that it helps. And if we were too small, we'd have a problem with the resources. So we're just about right and, and, and be able to pull off an experiment like this and little, our little experiment with truth. And the thing is, for a while there, and the board set, set me straight, to be perfectly honest. We were in a, a, a chase and take scenario. Chase grants, take it, write it down, hire people. And we had tons of people in there. We had accountants and we had to work with Clifton's office. And it got to the point where like, where are the students? I mean, we're hiring students, but just spend so much time administering grants and running these programs and whatnot, we, we were kind of getting away from it. And finally, in one of the board meetings, somebody broke the ice and said, uh, where are the students? And I was just so grateful because then we shifted mode with the wisdom of this board 
to looking at making and creating things. So forget about chase and take. Let's, let's make and create and create opportunities. Now people can seize an opportunity, but that's like walking through a door. But when students come in with a, a really good idea and they're pointing to a very specific part of the horizon, we have the ability to work with them to get to that place. It's not a one size fits all. That's the beauty of flexibility of what we're able to pull off. And so our, our equation is if we, if we get the right people at the right time, making the right decisions for the right reasons, and it's all about the students and keeping the focus on them, uh, miraculous things can happen. And that's, that's basically what we stuck to. And, and by creating, I also like to say that uh, we have courted with a lot of international organizations. We work with the White House. We work for the last four governors. We work for the last several chancellors. So we've worked for all sorts of people. This very building we're in was one of our cases. Henson Science Hall, we helped partner that, the Purdue Hall, Con uh, Conway Hall. So we do a lot of building stuff, but in, in a sense, it's, it's uh, materialistic problem solving, you know, engineers and architects. When students see that and they see social conflict, there is a connection. But we, we want them to see how things work well. Architects and engineers generally do a good job. So we get this, we get this formula going. We have the students working with us in whatever capacity it may be. And I'll just, I want to end with a focus on the student piece here. Is over the years, we've, had, we've been lucky. We've had some students with us for four years. We've had some students with us for six years. We've had some students with us for six years and then several years as a research assistant, maybe under a grant over in Clifton Griffin's office. But when, when you get to the point where they're facilitating a, a commission or they're doing a negotiated rulemaking for the federal government and you say, you know what, tonight, guys, uh, is Roberto here? Roberto. I did this to Roberto. Yep, well, there you are. Uh, I said, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to sit, sit down in the crowd tonight and, and, and kind of just send some signals. Now, some, for you older people, James Brown. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah? Godfather of Soul. The rest of you give me this weird look. Uh, he, when he would do his shows, he would use his hands and feet to do chains ups and whatnot, and the band would watch his hands, and they would, ju they would go with the chains and the tempo and all that sort of stuff. I said, look, I'm just going to do a couple hand things and just go for it. And, and it's like, it's fantastic. And these, these regions come up, and afterwards, like, your students are fantastic. And I'm not like a proud papa. I said, yeah, I mean, they really are very good. And that's where the satisfaction comes in. We are doing things. You will not get that in competitive programs, even in the Ivy Leagues, even in the highly endowed ones, because they're off in 35 different directions, writing books and things along those lines. So we like to create those kind of moments and help students find their way on the horizon. And what the present board has done is the first people who started the center nailed in some stakes and staked this out and said, we're going to be working here. And then as time went on, as the board has moved, we've changed the stakes and we were looking at not one straight future, but across the horizon, a variety of futures. And the reason being is we have a lot of people working with us saying, if you have students who want to get into cross-border water cooperation disputes, that's what I do professionally in the Middle East and I'd love to work with some of your students. Or if you're interested in I see Mitzi. Um, human trafficking, that's what our organization does. And, and if you want to bring your people there with us. And so at 3 o'clock in the morning, where's Dr. Fouts? Dr. Fouts here? So 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, we're, we're having uh, these phone conversations to get these students involved. And then they go off and do it. So when I talk about the future horizon of the center, I'm talking about where students want to go. Now, the, the real future is endowments and having faculty and things along those lines. But as long as we keep the focus on our students, we're going to be in great shape. And in 30 years, I'm, I'm hoping with the lecture series, we've had one person come back from Salisbury University to be in our lecture series, but I'm hoping in the years to come, we'll have a, a Nobel or somebody with the uh, Legion of Merit, which is highly likely, come and give a talk so you guys can be inspired or you guys could be the ones to do the inspiration for them. So, that's sort of like the little bit of, of the center. It's, as Dr. Buchanan said, it's, it's student-centered. If, if we can't get students involved, we just don't do it. And we do have things where it's confidential, they have to sign non-disclosure agreements, but we also do security-sensitive information. And periodically, if appropriate, and with approval, we'll work on something that's classified. 
But for the most part, we want students in the schools. We want them in doing the mediations in the courts. We want them to do all sorts of stuff and to get their, their feet wet and get in the sandbox, play out with us and figure out how this thing works, to trust themselves, to trust their instincts and, and to be more confident when they go out and compete, honestly, and to, and to win. Okay, so that's, that's the center piece I wanted to tell you about. So we're gonna shift gears and, and many thanks to, to all of the students who avail themselves of what we do at the center. You're the reason we exist. Okay, so we have, we wanna thank a whole bunch of people. And I think we're doing this in alphabetical order. We're gonna start with the, um, the center board of directors. And we have Dr. David Buchanan. And so Dave, uh, Dr. Buchanan, we have a little present for you. We just wanted to, and I, now's when I get to tell the lies. Um, but Dr. Buchanan told the truth pretty, pretty clearly. When he came to Salisbury University, uh, he came right at a time just before, just after Dr. Cathcart, uh, the, who was a provost and was on our board, uh, was retired. And Dave very much was able to integrate a lot of what we we're doing in the center with the department. And he's the guy who led the charge to um, build the major and to build the master's program and, and gave us, basically gave us the space to be what he wanted us to be, like be the change. And it was up to Dave, and uh, thank you for that, Dave, on behalf of all the students who've been in our program over the years. So thank you. Don Cathcart is with his family in Utah. He too is a former provost. He was here since the very beginning. Between Don, Dave, and Dr. Richards, they put in over 70 years of service to Salisbury University. So Matt, Matt Creamer, Doc, uh, Mr. Creamer, uh, so with the county, Matt came to Salisbury for a year or two, and 38 years later, he's still here. Matt, thank you for the reality nuts and bolts stuff you bring to the center in terms of all the work that we've done. Matt, Matt and I have had some really good projects, multi-billion dollar projects like the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, and we've worked on some um, honorable, I mentioned honorable, uh, projects like with the Dwight D. Eisenhower Memorial, get students involved in that. So this is, this is a, a monument, guys. It's like a shrine to somebody. This isn't just a project. And Matt, I appreciate your, your street smarts that you convey to the students and, and the wisdom that you've given to the board. So thank you, sir. Thank you. Jack, Jackie Granger. Jackie is a three-time graduate of Salisbury University. You think she'd learned a lesson, right? Jackie, uh, gosh, I, I don't know if there's anybody else who's a three-time graduate of Salisbury University. Do we, do we have? Uh, Jackie, Jackie has a lot of talent, a lot of skill, and uh, her IT and coding and things along those lines have actually helped us a great deal. And in fact, uh, if I get Mike Scott up here, um, some of the stuff we've done in algorithmic work and, and uh, artificial intelligence tracking bad people has kind of come from inspiration I've gotten from Jackie and just some conversations we've had. Jackie, thank you so much. We appreciate you. We love you. Yay. Connie Richards, Dr. Connie Richards. Uh, you, I suggest every single one of you have w with you an English professor so that when you write grants and proposals, she can read 100 pages like in two hours and make it all look good. But uh, it's the truth. It's the truth. <laughs> Connie, thank you. Uh, I think we've, we, we've gotten more success because our, her saying, Brian, did you really mean to say that? <laughs> but, but thank you, Connie. Thanks so much. I want to, uh, hey, what, Rob, Rob, Robert Lachance. Come on, come on up here, Rob. Rob is my sidekick. And Rob uh, was here. Oh, no, not, not you, Robbie Waller. Not yet. <laughs> Rob, Robert Chance. But you know what? That's, that's so omenish of you to do that. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Rob came here, uh, when I first met him, he was a student. So he's been here for, since the 90s in his student days. And I met him with a mohawk, his mohawk, that is. And he was a lacrosse, lacrosse uh, goalie. So he knows how to take hits, and, and big time. And you know, in some of the stuff we do in the center, you, you need to have tough skin along those lines. But uh, you've, you and I have built a lot of stuff together, and, and I'm glad you stuck around, because I know you've had chances over the years. I uh, appreciate you. I appreciate you uh, falling in love with Haley the Chance and bringing her here. Uh, I know Clifton Griffin does too because he's stolen from us. And, um, 
But, but in all seriousness, I, I'm, I'm looking to the future in terms of all the good things we have left to accomplish. You're, you're a good partner, man. I appreciate you. Thank you. Yes. Mitzi. Mitzi Purdue. I don't even know. I don't know where to start with her. She, she told me she had a van, and it's a stealth limo. And, th and, bro and we just used it a week or so ago with uh, Dr. Paraboom, Dr. Martino, you, Kathy, Ch Charles Overholt, and we went to a party in D.C. and uh, hung out with senators and whatnot, but we got to mess around with Bono. So thank you, Mitzi, for all the things you've done for the center very quietly. Sorry to pull you out into the, the light here, um, but I do want to say one thing. Mitzi is like your perfect person when it comes to, to networking and, and having, she has her head and heart in the right place, and her thing is human trafficking, and she's hooked us up with folks from MIT and Princeton, and, and they're showing our students some of the most miraculous stuff. We're watching things I didn't even know. It's, you don't know what you don't know kind of thing. We didn't even know how to ask these questions. We didn't know the questions existed on human trafficking until Mitzi got in her head to start asking these, these smart people, right? And, and she got them thinking, and they started asking questions, and they've, they've done some amazing work. We don't want to get too much away because we don't want the bad guys to know. But, but when it comes to the students understanding things like scenario building and analytics and whatnot, you've gone a long way, Professor. <laughs> Love you. Yeah? <laughs> so, so we will catch up because I, I have, I've got something for you tomorrow morning. We'll catch up. But thank you. All right. All right. Um, and, and, on the administrative, and on the administrative side of the house, we have a lot of people who have been super helpful bringing people into the center. Now, Chuck White had mentioned something. He, he doesn't remember this conversation. At least he says he doesn't remember this conversation about the UN Millennium Fellowship. And, and it somehow it got to Dr. Olmsted and got to a whole bunch of best friends on campus. And we say, hey, you know what? We're a, we're a United Nations University Regional Center of Expertise location. We should look into this. And, and then we started talking more to the deans because this is something we can create. And we got this great opportunity. We seized it. And we have been killing it. There's like a 7.8% chance that you're going to get this fellowship. 25,000 people apply. 16 of the 20 people who applied from Salisbury University got it. And last year, 13, or 11 out of 13 got it. It's like, we must be doing something right. And, and the fact is, we have so many good things that they can intertwine here on this campus and around the, the uh, community, and it's coordinated. They said, we like what you're doing. And Chuck, I do want to say something before. I, you're, you're white, so you're at the end alphabetically. But I do, I do want to say this. Uh, Chuck, Chuck has um, come to our conferences. We've hosted several um, America summits. But he wrote, he, wrote, he um, filmed a thank you and congratulations to the Salisbury University Millennium Class of 2021. And I'm watching this graduation, and I'm thinking, where? And, I, and we're talking to Noah, can, you know, is it in there? And what happened was, it got all the way to the very end, two hours, and I'm thinking, like, they, they didn't put him in. But at the very end, Chuck gets on. It's the last thing 20,000 people around the world are watching. And, and it's... When Chuck is finished, the Salisbury University logo sits there for about 20 seconds, and then the graduation's over. So thank you for that. I mean, you, you really elevated us in the eyes of the, the United Nations. So Kelly Fiala, is, is she here by any chance, Dr. Fiala? Hey, Kelly, I got something for you. A big, come on up here. You, or you go to her. Hey, Kelly, uh, you have sent us some some phenomenal students. And, and I say this, um, nurses bring people back to life. Now, my son wants to be a doctor. He, that, he said, you're a mechanic. Uh, you, you, you patch people together. But some of the best conflict resolution students we've had are nursing majors. They understand empathy. They understand it's a, a holistic thing. And, and when we've had students from Kelly's shop apply, every single one of them have gotten it. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it works. Um, Dane, Dr. Dane Fouts. Dane, come on up here. Dane, Dane's been around for a while. Uh, there's quite a few things we've done with students here, but I also wanted to mention, and 
and I don't, uh, uh, Christian said it was okay, but I'm not going to take the one from him. But Dane Fouts and Kristen Walton and, and um, I have worked with um, Fulbright, among other things, and really encouraged students and faculty to take advantage of the highest academic honor the federal government can bestow upon you. And if you want to know anything about Fulbright and your faculty member, talk to Dane or me. And if you're a student, you need to talk to Dr. Walton. We, we need to keep uh, the ball rolling. People in Washington and on the Hill are watching us. They know us. That we're on their tongues. Dane, thank you so much for everything. Okay. Um, Dr. Clifton Griffin. Dr. Griffin. Oh, there you are. Clifton, I've already mentioned you a couple times, but on, on the research end and on uh, graduate assistantships and basically helping us with some of the mechanics of trying to figure out the, the whole grants and contract thing. Thank you, sir. We appreciate you so much. Now, uh, B's not here, Beatrice Hardy, but, uh, uh, oh, um, uh, Martha, right? Yes, Martha. You, the best part of uh, any university, come on up here. Hey, hey, can you get Beatrice, B, B Hardy? Beatrice. Um, I'll say this about the, the library and the center. You, what connection is the, the library is connected to everybody, but the library staff, of which many are masters graduates of our program, um, have helped us find information that should be readily available to U.S. citizens that is is not there. You go on looking for it, you're in the archives, and you, it's supposed to be there, and it's been taken away. And and it's like, why is that? And your your folks have done such a good job helping us and the students do our research. It's just it would be remiss not to say this is this is the like the palace of the university and we appreciate everything you've done for us. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Henry. <gasps> hey. You know the center was originally supposed to be in education and social work way back in the day. And <clears throat> I would like to thank you again. You've helped us. You've, you've sent us some seriously good people. Um, not only are they uh, top shelf in your school and in this university, but they really got on the radar of the United Nations. And when it comes to education and uh, peace and, and uh, just societies, your folks have led the way. And I wouldn't be surprised, even though they're educated, I wouldn't be surprised if UNESCO comes on some of the educational programs looking for them. But thank you. You do have a three-time grad? Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Jackie, it's, it's on. <laughs> hey, Dr. Karen Olmstead, yay. The, the, the orchestrator. Karen has so many things she needs to do, but, but when it comes to things like the center and things that don't always completely fit the mold, I appreciate so much the flexibility and the patience for us to get where we need to be. And, and she's taking us into a new, an up to another step, step in a new realm. And uh, I appreciate you just being so patient. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, uh, where were we? Oh, Andrew, Dr. Martino. Dr. Martino? Hey, Andrew. I think of, I think of the Honors College as the mosh pit. And, and, and I think all the crazy stuff you've got to do, you know, it's not as order and structure, but this, there's people with a lot of excitement, a lot of energy. And Andrew, uh, thank you as well from all the other people, but for sending people, literally sending people our way, saying, like, you need to go over the center and see what they're doing. And, and they're already predisposed to be energetic. And I know you've got them all jazzed up before they get there. So I appreciate you getting them all jazzed up because I don't have to do it. And, and they're ready to go. So thank you, sir. Okay. Um, Martin Paraboom, Dr. Paraboom had, actually had a class tonight, so uh, Dr. Egan, Dr. Egan? Uh, Dr. Egan. So our home is in, it, in the Department of Conflict Analysis and Dispute Resolution in the center is the Fulton School. We appreciate Martin. Tell him, uh, well, he'll see it, but um, all the stuff that he's done now, he, he has a little bit of, uh, he needs to let go a little bit in terms of not everyone has to be conflict in political science or uh, a Fulton person to appreciate and get the center, but he, he's, he's getting it. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Okay, uh, Mike, Dr. Scott. Hey, so 
uh, the Dr. Scott of the Henson School. Mike, you're, you're, we've known each other for a long time, and, and I think he missed his calling. He should have never been a dean or an academic. You should have been a comic. Yes. The yeah, very first time he's a dean, he says, oh, Mom, I'm here in a suit, you know, faking it. <laughs> I said, oh, man, he's a cool dean. <laughs> uh, Mike, your people have done some things that I, I can't say too much about. Uh, it's in line with what's going on with Mitzi Purdue. But math and, and uh, algorithms and GIS and literally modeling stuff in terms of conflict modeling, it, you've been a huge asset to some of the stuff we're doing. And, and it's not lost on some of our folks, including the Prime Minister of Nepal, Dalba, some of your guys and some of your students. By the way, some of the people who've been doing work for us or, or helping us out are juniors and seniors, not just faculty members. So thank you, Mike. I really appreciate you. Yeah. Okay. And then we have Christy Weir. Wendy's going to... Wendy. 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 We only have two more guys and we're ready to go. Wendy, a graduate of our master's program, is accepting this on behalf of Christy Weir. Tell Christy something. When it comes to conflict resolution processes and thinking over the horizon, the private sector is 15 years ahead of the public sector because they only eat what they kill. And if you don't, you go the way of the dinosaurs. So when you're looking for innovation in conflict scenarios and how to survive a crisis, the private sector does a phenomenal job. And she knows her faculty think like that. And the entrepreneurial, how do we get it done spirit. So please give her our best and, and thank you. And then you'll keep recruiting for me? All right. I'll write you a chat. Just kidding. And finally, we have, we have uh, save the best for last, Dr. Chuck White. Dr. White, thank you, sir. I'm sorry to see that you're, you've only been here for four years, but you've helped a great deal. As I was mentioning, sir, you, you had, it seems like every time could you help us out, you remind me of Desmond too, too. You know, you write a letter, you do a video, and it always leads to a good conclusion. So thank you so much for your support. We're gonna miss you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Coco. Dr. Jacques Coco, he's the director of the graduate program in the Department of Conflict Analysis and Dispute Resolution. And I, and I, I refer to him as my priest. He's, he's, a, he's a Jesuit up here, right? And Benedictine down here. You should, you're, you're an imposter, man. You're a priest acting like a professor. Come on up here. So um, can we, <laughs> come here, brother. <laughs> uh, I think they're the red ones. So I, I, I want to say something real quickly and introduce Vern Proctor and Dr. Maggie Proctor. Vern uh, is a Harvard trained well, undergrad in uh, the law, Harvard Law uh, professor. And he came back to school and did his master's degree with us. It was a total joy to have him. And his wife, Dr. Maggie. Now, you're a pediatrician, but you're also a lawyer, too, right? I don't know. I don't know. This education stuff. But what they did is they provided a scholarship that Dr. Coco is going to say a little something about, and we're going to present the very first one right now. Thank you, Dr. Pokinghorn. I like to crowd the, the room with my voice, and uh, sometimes I feel like I don't need the microphone. But uh, tonight, uh, I have to follow the rules. I must confess that, you know, I feel embarrassed because, uh, you know why? <laughs> okay, I was waiting for that because because I'm not wearing my suits. I feel like I'm bridging you know, the dress code, the protocol. And I hope you guys uh, will forgive me for that. For some reason, at 4 p.m., I, uh, I found myself in Baltimore, and uh, I managed to drive. Where I was, I didn't need a suit. So I managed to drive to make sure that I make it to the events. This event, because it's so meaningful, so important to me, and uh, I can tell you that I'm very happy to be here. Well, tonight we're celebrating so many things, right? We all know. Of course, 30 years of the center. 30 years, that's a lot. But uh, compared to 88, it's not much. There's still a long way. The road ahead is still long. 
So 30 years come with challenges. Of course, we're celebrating the successes, right? But 30 years come with challenges. And mine, when I was 30, was to find my way to quit the priesthood and start finding somebody to get married to. Can you imagine a new priest looking for a woman to get married to? That's a challenge, right? And I do believe that the center has its own challenges, and uh, we are very, very mindful of it. And uh, as we like celebrating all the successes, we know that the road ahead to reach 88 presents us with so many challenges that we all will face gladly. I think uh, Dr. Arun Gandhi will uh, agree with me that uh, wisdom comes with age. At least that's how we see it in Africa. In uh, my African traditions, we believe that uh, as we age in, we become wise. So in addition to the 30 years we're celebrating for the center, we of course celebrating wisdom. Namaste. And I'm saying it with a lot of respect because I admire him. I mean, any time he speaks, every time he speaks, I find my way to get something from what he's saying. You are so inspiring to me, and I thank you for being here tonight to celebrate with us. Of course, another thing that we're celebrating is our students, right? I mean, we can't be here without them. We can't do anything without our students. So I want you to join me to give a big one to our students. <laughs> Let me tell you, our students are great. We get, I think, the best of the best. And I see them all over the place on campus. You know, they are in res life, trying to help uh, everybody with conflict. I don't know, but I think uh, our department gets uh, a whole lot of grad assistant to deal with conflict on, on campus. And uh, a lot has to do with the center. So Dr. Pokingon, we're very, very grateful to the work that you're doing, and we appreciate it. So it's critical that we celebrate our students because they're good. But some of them are very good. They're all good, don't get me wrong. And uh, they are very good by exemplifying what we preach in the classroom, beyond the classroom, in their day-to-day -day life. And one of them is the Cynthia Lombardo. And I'm very pleased tonight to announce that she will be the first recipient of the generous scholarship we got from uh, Mr. Vern and his family. So I want you to join me in uh, also recognize uh, the Protoc family, Vern and Madame. Would you mind standing up for us to like, you know, recognize you? <laughs> Thank you so much, Vern. And uh, I, uh, I was, you know, talking previously about Dr. Arun Gandhi, how he inspires me. And I think uh, I can say the same thing to some extent, you know, as far as Vern is concerned. You know, Vern was in my grad class a few years ago, and I felt like I was not in a position to teach him. <laughs> so you imagine how you get like a wise man, you know, coming to you like, a, you know, a spring chicken to get wisdom from you. That tells you who the man is, very humble and inspiring as well. And he was uh, in my class like a critical yeast. We all know what the yeast does, right? I mean, help us rise. Vern, thank you so much. And you know, beyond the classroom, he continued to help us by sharing with us what he has, his money. <laughs> all right? That's beautiful. And I hope that many of us, many of us will follow suit. And uh, our department, our grad students, will get enough money to study these skills, these skills that we all need, conflict resolution skills. So it's uh, my honor to announce the first recipient of the Proto, Proto Family Scholarship, 
Ms. Cynthia Lombardo. Thank you so much. So uh, we, have, we have two more uh, scholarships we want to hand out, and, and, then, and then Dr. Gandhi will introduce you, you can do your talk. But uh, before we tell you who these folks are, something, something uh, unusual happened when there's two different committees and looking at people and whatnot, and uh, so I went into this after having talked to folks about the Arun and Sananda Gandhi Scholarship for Graduate Student epitomizing many of the characteristics we see in not only Dr. Gandhi, but his late wife, Sananda, who happened to be a, a nurse, and it's like the steel backbone for the family, a, a great lady. <clears throat> and so uh, we have two scholarships, one for an undergraduate and one for a graduate student. And the undergraduate student is, is this is weird, Robbie Waller, where are you? Robert Waller, come up here. <laughs> when, when I was talking to Rob, the chance, I think you saw me, and I was just thinking, like, that's an omen, man. <laughs> oh. so, so Rob's studying nursing. Come on up here. Rob's studying nursing, and he's an unusual character. He's always asking questions. I think he gets Gandhi. He asks these higher level of order questions. Uh, you're always asking me something, it seems like, <laughs> which is good, which is good. And, and you're the first recipient, and, and the fact that... It, it, it's in honor of both Arun and Sananda, and she's a nurse, and you have that same sort of oomph she had. We just thought you were a great connection. <laughs> hey, where are your parents? Are they here? No, yeah, they're at home tonight. Okay. My mom had to work late. All right, let me. Yeah, go ahead. You're done. Okay. Now, here, here's the other thing, is when we were looking for the graduate student and same characteristics and whatnot, and we had made our decision, and we talked about this, we came up with... Cynthia Lobardo. <laughs> so, Cynthia, come here. <laughs> I think Arun would be very pleased. Do, do you have a... Yes. I don't even know where to start with Cynthia. She, she's cut from very special cloth. She does some... Uh, she's in... I don't know. You're like a genius. You know everything is going on. You're, you've got it together. Uh, but uh, she clearly has her head and heart uh, all in the right place. She, the, the compassion you have for people, the empathy you have for people, the, you're just a very good person to have. I hope Salisbury University can find a way to keep her. Uh, but she's probably going to wind up in India with Dr. Gandhi. But, and, and uh, Arun, do you approve? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Well, congratulations. Thank so, you. Okay. Okay. Remember, and remember that you guys all get unbirthday presents. Arun, Arun's getting several. In fact, I got one right here. Hold on. Let me just hide this real quick. Don't look, Arun. Don't look. Um, so, April is Autism Acceptance Month. Last year, April was Autism Awareness Month. And a year ago today, uh, Nathan, your godson, introduced uh, uh, Dr. Gandhi to a group of people. And he's going to do it tonight. He's all excited and ready to do it. And so would you come on up here, Nathan? Come on. Come on. You get to introduce Dr. Gandhi. And Kayla, you can come up too if you want. All right. All right. All right. Are you ready? Dr. Arun Gandhi was born in South Africa on April 14, 1934. He grew up just outside Durban in a place called the Phoenix Settlement, an ashram founded by his grandparents. Arun several times to India as a boy to visit his family. He spent a couple years living with his grandparents, Mohandas and Katsturba Gandhi. Even as a youngster, Arun knew his grandparents were loved and deeply respected. That makes sense because that is what Mahatma means. Arun's grandfather was Mahatma to the world, but to Arun, he was grandfather. And just 
one half of a loving, dynamic duo. His grandmother dotted on Arun and his sisters. She often made him sweets. She loved her children and grandchildren very much. His grandfather often held meetings with famous people, so the press was around all the time. Being a kid, sometimes Arun got into mischief, and some of his antics are recorded in the history books. I have known Arun since the day I was born. He tells me I am the youngest student because my mom took me to Arun's class here on campus when I was just six days old. I don't remember that, but I am sure whatever he was teaching was all about being good to others and being there when they needed help. Arun has been there for me my entire life, even when he is far away in another country. He will call and chat with me on the phone just to see how things are going. My dad doesn't mind when Arun spends more time talking to me than him. He knows that Arun and I are tight. Arun encouraged me to be my best, and he gets me to reach a little higher and do things like come up here and introduce him um, so I can finish the last requirement of my Boy Scout Peace Messenger Award. Thank you for helping me with that, Arun, but I don't know if the guys in my troop will believe me. Friends, family, students, and teachers, please help me welcome to the podium Dr. Arun Gandhi, a peace farmer and the spiritual guide of the Bossman Center for Conflict Resolution. That's the best introduction I've had in all these 88 years. <clears throat> I'm grateful to my dear friend Brian uh, for organizing a birthday party for me. Um, I don't know, at 88, it's not a very happy birthday. <laughs> But <clears throat> it's good to be with friends. And uh, I would like to congratulate Brian also for the 30th anniversary of his wonderful center with which I have been associated for about 20 years. And I hope that this center will <clears throat> grow and continue to help people around the world for the next 30 years. I know I won't be here for the celebration of the 60th, but <laughs> I hope it will um, be a wonderful celebration. And the work that you do will continue to flourish and continue to make this world a better place. Lately, we have been seeing a lot of evil things happening in the world. We had uh, major conflicts in Libya. There's a big conflict going on in Yemen and now in Ukraine. And it really boggles my mind when I look at the things that we do to one another in this kind of situation. I think we are losing our humanity and we just have no respect for human life at all. It makes me go back many years to the time when my grandfather went to South Africa as a young lawyer. He had just graduated from the law school in London and he got this assignment in South Africa to represent an Indian merchant. And he went purely 
to make money because he was saddled, like all, all of you students know what it means to be saddled with uh, student debt. He had a major debt to pay back uh, for his education. And he in additionally had the responsibility of taking care of a joint family. His mother and his brothers and their families. And he was the only bread earner for them. So he had this major responsibility at the age of 22, 23, when he went to South Africa. But it was there that he uh, began to see the inhumanity of people against people. He came closely in touch with the apartheid. At that time, it wasn't known as apartheid, but it was prejudice against people of, the, of color. He read about things that were happening in other parts of Africa, like Burundi, where the Germans were massacring the local Burundian people, in Congo, where the Belgians were massacring a lot of the Congolese people. And he experienced the same thing in South Africa, where the British were massacring a lot of the local African people. In fact, he was so concerned about this that during the revolution, the Zulu revolution, when the Zulus rebelled against the uh, inhuman taxes levied upon them by the British administration and refused to pay taxes, the British sent their army and uh, started massacring the Zulus. Grandfather was a volunteer there with a lot of other Indian uh, people to take care of the uh, injured and the dead Zulus because the white people had refused to take care of them. They were content to kill them, but they were not going to take care of the injured. And grandfather went there to take care of these people. And that's where he came closely in touch with the inhumanity, where he saw British soldiers firing on Zulus who were running away from them, shooting them in the back just to get practice, shooting practice, because they were equipped with the Royal Enfield rifles that had just been come out, and they were practicing shooting on Zulus. <clears throat> the same thing was happening in the Cong Congo and in the Burundi by the Germans and the Belgians. And when he saw this, he began to reflect on this and he re realized that all of this was being done because they wanted to make money. Colonization of nations was taking place because they wanted to make money and get rich. And he came to the conclusion that money and materialism was at the root of all the evils that we face today in society. And he, that is the foundation on which his philosophy of nonviolence was built. He realized that unless we change, unless we change our habits of greed and selfishness and, and, 
anger and, and all the violence that uh, this was leading to, that we will never be able to live happily together in peace. And the change, he said, has only, can only come when we decide that we want to be better human beings, that we want to um, be more civilized, more humane, that we want to be nonviolent and peaceful people who have respect for everybody and understanding and acceptance of of diversity that exists within us. And that was the basis on which his philosophy was built. And he practiced this in his life. And he demonstrated through his own life that it is possible to live peacefully and, and uh, with respect and understanding. And this is something that we all need to understand and appreciate. Today, unfortunately, people have not really understood his philosophy in depth. They know only about the use of this philosophy to get political conflict resolution that he used it in India against the British and got independence for India. Dr. M uh, Mandela used it in South Africa and Dr. King used it in this country and several others in other countries used philosophy of nonviolence to get political freedom. Now that is just a fraction of his philosophy. The greater part of his philosophy is about being, bringing about personal transformation. If we don't transform ourselves, if we don't learn to build better relationships, if we don't learn to sacrifice for other people and respect other people, we are never going to get rid of conflict. And then we can have institutes for conflict resolution uh, all the time, and we just do patchwork conflict resolution and continue this practice. And that is not what civilization means. Civilization means that we live a civilized life. And a civilized life is where we have respect for each other, respect for human beings, whatever their color, whatever their um, race, and, and whatever their religion. This is what his hope and expectation was. And unless we learn about this and begin to incorporate this in our lives, we are never going to get rid of conflict. And that conflict is just going to continue to rise. And I can see that even though the conflicts that took place 70 and 80 years ago, when, which transformed my grandfather and and made him um, change his life from being a lawyer to becoming a, a, a peacemaker. That even though they were inhuman, what we see today, I think, is 10 times worse. And it only shows that we are losing our humanity very quickly. And we are moving far, far away from a civilized lifestyle. Now we have to come back to what we really mean by civilization. 
and we need to work hard to bring about that civilization. Many years ago, when a journalist asked my grandfather, what do you think of Western civilization? His response was, it's a very good idea. And today I can say, if somebody asks me, what do you think of Western civilization? I would say it's about time we become civilized. I'm hoping that you young people who have passed from this course in conflict resolution, who are going to inherit this world, will make the change that we need very badly to bring this world back to a civilized existence. Thank you very much. Dr. Gandhi is willing to take just a few questions um, and then we'll do our wrap up and invite you to have um, food with us. So if we have two or three people who have a question, um, I invite you to come up to the microphone here and, and ask your question. So how do you think your uh, grandfather would view all the conflicts going on today and what would be his philosophy to everyone in this room regarding how we can better resolve the conflicts of the world and come together at times when it feels like there is so much division in the world? Well, many of these conflicts are taking place because of bad relationships, because of greed and, and uh, and all the uh, negative things that are going on in our civilized society. So he would have uh, started working on changing that, making uh, people realize that we have to build better relationships with people and uh, give up greed and, and the selfishness. So it's, you know, um, we, in modern society have begun to look at conflicts only when they become a crisis. And uh, then we want to find a solution quickly. And you can't always do that in a non-violent way. And that's why they adopt the violent way because that is a quick solution. Just kill the person and be done with it. Now, we have taken a very easy way out in modern society by defining people as good people and bad people. And the idea is that if we get rid of all the bad people, we'll be le left with good people. But we forget that each one of us is capable of doing bad things, depending on what buttons are pressed. So are we going to dis destroy all of humanity because we are all capable of doing bad things? So it's not, the world cannot be divided into good people and bad people. The world can only be recognized the fact that some people do bad things. And when we change that perception that some people do bad things, then we would look at why is that person doing bad things and what can be done to help that person stop doing bad things. But instead, we just, he's the bad person, lock him up in the prison or kill him and the world would be a better place. So this, this kind of what I call the culture of violence is, you know, crisis management. And we can't always have crisis management. We have to look at a conflict in long term and try to bring about a long term solution. Dr. Gandhi, my name is Todd Becker. I'm uh, an adjunct uh, working with the Conflict Resolution Department. I've spent 50 years of my life doing what you just said we should do. And that is working to understand, I was a diplomat and then worked as an international peacekeeper. 
I spent 50 years trying to communicate, trying to reach that understanding of what is it that causes that other person to hate me so much that he might want to fly jet planes into the World Trade Center, or he might hate me so much and my friends that he would invade a peaceful country neighbor next door, as Mr. Putin has. One of the problems I have, because I've been a person who has believed in seeking communication, of building respect, of building understanding, is when the other person doesn't want to do that, what do we do? Do we have the right? Do we have the capacity to watch others destroy civilization around us by not responding with more force. I don't want to respond with force. But how does one respond when the other party doesn't want to participate in nonviolent means? Well, I think, uh, you know, to quote my grandfather, he said, we have to live what we want others to learn. We can't teach them just by telling them, but we have to show it in our life and in our behavior. And that's what he did uh, in many cases, and uh, he was very successful in even um, uh, transforming the most prejudiced person in South Africa. There's a story of his uh, transforming the prime minister of South Africa, uh, General Smuts, who was a very prejudiced person and, uh, you know, he didn't like people of color. But grandfather never showed him any disrespect. In spite of uh, smuts often, you know, insulting grandfather and talking down to him, grandfather never showed any of that. In fact, he respected him tremendously and showed him consideration. Um, the, what happened was in 1913, when grandfather decided to launch his final campaign in South Africa against uh, prejudices and against the laws uh, that discriminated against people of color, as he always did, he made everything public. He told the news media what he was going to do, why he was going to do it, where he was going to do it. Everything was made public. And after that was published in the newspapers and broadcast in the media, the workers of the South African Railways decided to go on a strike. And uh, Grandfather, when he read this in the newspapers, he realized that uh, this is going to be a major headache for the government. And so he didn't want to add his own problems to the government. And uh, so he announced the withdrawal of his campaign until the government was able to um, resolve the strike. And the leaders of the strikers came to grandfather and said, we are fighting the same enemy. So why don't you join us and we can strengthen each other and fight the government. And grandfather said, I don't have any enemies. I am not fighting enemies. I am trying to transform friends. And he refused to join the uh, workers. So the workers went on strike. <clears throat> and as they always do, there was a lot of anger and a lot of frustration. So they were marching around in the streets, shouting angry slogans and down with the government and all that kind of thing. So it was very easy for the administration or the police to infiltrate the ranks of the strikers and cause an incident that gave them justification to crush the strike violently. 
And then grandfather launched his campaign and there was no anger, no frustration, no um, responses. In fact, they were very uh, courteous to the police when the police came to arrest them. They walked into the police uh, vans and voluntarily uh, got arrested. And very soon the prisons were filled up with uh, nonviolent strikers. And that's when Prime Minister Smuts called grandfather and uh, asked him, he said, I could deal with the strikers because there was so much anger and frustration there that I could light a little match and cause an incident and justify using violence against them. But he said, I don't know how to deal with you. You show so much compassion and understanding and love towards us that I don't know how to deal with you. And that is what his philosophy of nonviolence was. That he didn't expect results. He just wanted action. He showed the respect and understanding and love to the to people who were opposed to him. And he didn't care whether they were going to respond or not. But because he was sincere and because he didn't expect a, re, uh, a response from them, they had to respond in kind. And I think that's what he meant when he said, we must live what we want others to learn. So we would like to invite everyone here um, and any of your loved ones to travel with us uh, later this year. Um, and so if we can move to the next slide, you'll see a flyer that is on the table when you exit um, the assembly hall this evening. So Dr. Gandhi has been taking students and adults to India and South Africa for more than 20 years to allow them to follow in the footsteps of his grandfather, to go to the places where he lived, learned, studied, and, and did his work. Um, and so our two-week tour of India starts at the end of December, the 29th, um, through January. So students, it's during our winter break. Um, if you'd like to join us, you can get credit for undergrad or graduate work. But this is open to anyone. You don't have to be a student. So it will be a mixed group. Um, we also have the opportunity to go to a variety of NGOs, non-governmental organizations, that Dr. Gandhi has selected um, for us because they were started by one person. And they're good examples of how one person can make an enormous difference in the lives of others. So you'll be exposed to all different types of organizations doing things for children who previously were in conditions of child labor, um, women's rights, uh, disabilities rights, uh, environmentalism. So it's a wonderful opportunity to travel with Dr. Gandhi, with his son Tushar, uh, with Dr. Polkinghorne, and, and many others. So if you're interested in the tour, grab a flyer on the table on your way out. I'll be coordinating the tour again. I went in 2019, I ran the last tour in 2020, so I should be able to answer all of your questions um, and I would love to hear from you. So before we wrap, um, I'm gonna ask our crew in the back to play just a brief video that will give you a flavor of what it would be like to go on this tour. Now I would say that I'm the last generation who lived with Bapuji during the last two years of his life. The things that he taught me and, and told me uh, made a very big difference uh, in my life. As I grew up, I saw the importance of his philosophy and I decided that I have to share this with as many people as possible. 
I bring all these guests from America to show them Gandhiji's work in action. Well, common thread that binds all the projects that we visit on the Legacy Tour is the spirit of yes, I can, because the people who started those projects started them individually. Gandhi always said, if you want to develop any country, you have to think last person of the society. What Avni does, we think about the last person, that is the children. The Barefoot College is a model which is replicable anywhere in the world, and it is a Gandhian model. And the Gandhian model is still relevant today. My main message is no need of the renovation. The need is the rejuvenation of this planet. And you can rejuvenate this planet if you give love, affection and respect to the nature. I think we are in desperate times. We live in desperate times where there is a huge question mark on our future. My grandfather Bapuji uh, always dreamed that we would all be living happily together even in spite of our diversity. We still have a long way to go and uh, hope that the next generation, Tushar and others, will continue with the work after we are gone. So this is the last time that Arun will be leading this tour. So again, I encourage you to think about coming and I'd be happy to speak with any of you about the opportunity. All right, thank you so very much for coming out this evening. We really appreciate you. Please stay, mingle, have lots of food, take pictures with Dr. Gandhi. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much.